Hello, hello, hello. This is Alex Nashevska. Welcome on this uh, Monday evening. Um, when everybody, when everybody, anybody joins, let me know if you can hear me in the comments. You can uh, give me a uh, thumbs up or a heart, or you can just comment. When you're joining, do comment on uh, where you're joining from and what time it is for you. And if you're viewing this as a replay, do a hashtag replay so that I can uh, re uh, respond to your comments afterwards. Um, and welcome to Way to Grow. So tonight's topic, today's topic is um, the seven lessons that I learned as a leader. So why am I talking about this? Well, because many of you are either leaders or are going to be leaders. For example, when you're in network marketing and some of you, um, well, I want you to really be able to recognize a good leader for various reasons. Well, maybe you will need one in the future, right? And maybe you will have a chance to select yours, your mentor or your leader. So that's why I'm talking about this um, today. I think it's a very interesting topic. So I've been a leader all my life, basically. I started early in uh, primary school being the class leader uh, for a couple of years. Then I was, um, a, when I was sailing, I was a, a leader of the sailboat and, uh, uh, you know, in high school, possibly I was leading many, many various um, initiatives. And afterwards, uh, uh, when I was studying, there were other initiatives and at work, I was also a leader in um, various projects. Then I was a manager. Uh, etc 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 and i want to say my background is it i'm an it engineer so what i'm going to be talking about is basically how to be a leader for a uh, team and uh, the rules really work very well uh, in it but they can also be shifted to other uh, other areas so whenever you hear something that is uh, interesting uh, you can put it down in the comments so that people are able to see it afterwards and um, also in the meantime if you had a leader in your life leader possibly maybe a mentor somebody that really made an impression on you i would like you to put in the comments the information on what they did to impress you like when was that aha moment when you said oh yeah now that is a leader that is good leadership, okay? Maybe some of the things will be the, the things that I am uh, going to be talking about today. Uh, I've, I've chosen only seven lessons and there's many, many, many more, okay? So, uh, but I've chosen only these uh, to, to make it short enough. So without further ado, let's start with lesson number one and that is form diverse teams. I cannot stretch this enough. Diverse teams and diversity comes in many uh, colors <laughs> and I'm not talking about skin color but it may come as gender diversity. So in general, if you're not working, um, thanks Rush, if you're not working in an environment which is only male or female oriented, you want to have, you want to form teams of people of different genders. So, and don't let them be singles. Like you don't want to have a team with one man only or a one woman only, right? You want to have at least two of them. And um, hey, Kimberly, with uh, my IT background, the way I was forming teams, because that's one of the best sizes of a team, if you can do that, is around seven people, okay? So the best size of a team is around seven people. So you wanna say from five maybe to, to nine, at least uh, in the IT agile environment, if anybody's familiar with, the, with that. That's basically the amount of people that allows you to have interactions with them and to pay enough attention to them, right? If you have more people, get leaders, create leaders among them so that you have a structure, so, they, so that you have a hierarchy, right? Um, and so if you have eight people, for example, it's good to have uh, four men and four women because then, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an equal um, the, um, division. And so, for example, men are better at... Uh, in crisis because they're less emotional than uh, than women in general now i'm not talking about individual cases right but women tend to get more, more, more emotional but they also talk about their feelings which allows a more open atmosphere now in a completely male environment the very often showing your feelings and showing your emotions is not even allowed right 
So the connections and the relationships that are formed are not really full because as human beings, emotions and feelings are really important for us. And when you're not discussing this, uh, the relationship is basically not full. Hey, Navid, good to see you here. Um, men are better at solving problems as well, whereas women, they tend to focus on the details. They, get, they are better at analysis because they want to talk everything through, right? Which causes them to get down to the root cause of the problem, while men focus on solving the problem which may cause some details to be left un, uh, unnoticed, right? So these are the differences. Now the second, um, and this is very important, the second rule of forming teams is to form them um, with diverse personality types. So again, if you have eight people on a team, you may have two people of each personality type. And if we're using for this, as an example, my personality um, type cards, I can tell you this. If you have action takers on the team, they're going to be the people who are innovative. They're going to be chasing projects. They're going to want to pitch projects to CEOs, right? To um, higher management. They're going to be making improvements. They're going to be chasing new things or they're going to be willing to take risks. Now that combined with the blueprints, is a very good team because blueprints will not be willing to take risks so they will be able to say to the uh, the action takers hey you know you may want to think about this but also these are people who are willing to document what the action takers are talking about and create a system out of it so that it's less chaotic and it makes more sense to everybody else thus giving an additional um, edge and benefits to the, the ideas of the action takers, right? So these two form um, amazing, uh, amazing teams, given they respect their boundaries and they know what they're about and they um, realize that uh, it's not um, the blueprints or the action takers are not trying to sabotage the project. It's just their personality types. So it's very important that the people are aware why you're forming a diverse team and what the diversity gives us to a team. Now, when you take a look at knowledge people, they, they will do the analysis. So compared to action takers, for example, they will stop them and say, hey, right, that's a good idea, but you need to think about it from this angle and this angle and another angle. And they're, they're willing to do the research, so they will not allow you to chase uh, an idea which doesn't make any sense, for example, or maybe somebody else has already realized it. They may be seen as the naysayers, so they're going to object if, you, if you're trying to um, get your idea to, uh, to life, right? But uh, in the end, it's good to have them and it's good to listen to them. Absolutely, it's great. Um, and then the nurturers, they will take care of the harmony in the team. So whenever there is a conflict situation, hey, hey Claire, whenever there is a conflict situation, they will manage it so that everybody gets listened to, for example. So you don't just have the one action taker who's going to be shouting on everybody else, but they will want uh, to conduct the meeting in a respectful manner, which is very important. And also they will be verifying whether what you're trying to do is going to hurt anybody or not. And they will also be the ones Awesome, thank you, Claire. And they will also be the ones who will engage the team to work together. Maybe even, you know, over time, who knows? Okay, so that's the first rule, diversity. Second rule is take care of uh, the team's personal development. You don't want them to go stagnant. And I would take care of it from the beginning. As soon as you start to uh, get to know your team members, what I do is I have a vision for their development. So each of us has our talents and each of us has our flaws, right? And you know, the, fo the brain tends to focus on the negative. So some of your team members may be focusing on their flaws and working on their flaws, right? Whereas that might not be the best way to work for them. Maybe 
they should focus more on their talents and grow their talents. And it's your um, job to make them realize that they also have talents, that they have talents, that they have flaws, and for you to draw the vision for them together, right? Together with them, so you engage them into drawing the vision, but also you as a leader have access to additional information which your team doesn't have access to. So you can grab opportunities that show up and bring them to your team members and say, hey, this is on your career path. This is on your path. This is where I see you. You should try this, etc." right? Some of them will need more encouragement. Some of them will need less encouragement depending on the personality types. You will always adjust what you're uh, offering to them, right? In the end, really, you want them to start seeing the opportunities and grabbing them on their own for themselves, right? Uh, next thing is uh, to share your vision. Now, that is very important. And that's one of the first things that I do whenever I am anointed a leader. Apart from getting to know my team members, sharing my vision, so you want to have a vision for about two, three years in advance and show the people that there is a place for each of them in this vision and show them what is your goal. What's your common goal? Now, that really decreases the amount of chaos and that causes people to, uh, first of all, if you're anointed as a leader uh, chosen from existing team members, if you show them that you have a vision, you're putting yourself in a leadership position. And it can sometimes be very difficult to, um, to be perceived as a leader because so far you are their colleague, right? You're one of them and suddenly, bam, you're a leader. So sharing your vision for the team uh, makes them feel like you know what you're doing and they see you as a unique person and, uh, and, uh, and, and a leader. So um, share your vision, have it prepared and make it clear. And I will get to the next point uh, where it shows how important the vision is, how important that everybody understands is. And the next thing that I share also when I do my leader expose is uh, rules, meaning, and I'm an action taker, so I'm not a big on rules, you know, but what I'm going to share with my team, and that's very important, is what kind of what kinds of behaviors are going to be praised and respected what i expect from the team and team members what kind of behaviors and what will not be tolerated now you do this very shortly you know that it's a couple statements only but you want to set boundaries for people that also helps to establish you as a leader in the beginning of course afterwards you need to follow the rules uh, next thing is a team without a leader is still a team. So there is this uh, concept of being hit uh, by a bus factor uh, among project managers. It, it exists among project managers. So the name is pretty bad, but it's actually so <laughs> what it's supposed to show you is what if you were hit by a bus and you couldn't show up the next day or the next couple of days or the next couple weeks or months. This is a random um, event occurring. Your need, team needs to be able to proceed as they were, exactly. So that's why your vision, where your vision, your goals and your rules apply. They will still know where they were going. Now, in order to achieve that, you want to, um, Appoint your replacement so that they know that if anything happens, there, there's going to be a, a new leader and it's this person, but also they know what to do. They just keep on going. So decrease the amount of, um, of chaos. And also you don't want to be micromanaging them. You don't, if you are the kind of manager or leader who always tell people what tells people what to do, if you're suddenly not there, they're not going to know what to do. So if you vanish, your team vanishes. It's as simple as that. So a team without a leader is still a team. Point number five, be authentic and fair. Obviously, this is true for any business and should be true for any of us. But when you're a leader, when you want to be a leader, this is especially important. So. 
Being authentic may be especially difficult if you're a new leader and have never been in a leadership position. That's why I, I would advise you to take on leadership positions as often as you can to practice. Now, when you were anointed a leader out amongst, um, chosen from amongst colleagues and suddenly you start acting completely differently because you're stressed, because you're not sure what you're doing or because you have this vision of what a leader should do, they will call you on it and they will not follow you. Nobody will follow you if you're not authentic. Leaders have to be authentic. Now, if you're authentic and you're creating an atmosphere of honesty, you will never hear from your team words like when you ask them for feedback. Oh, it's all good. Everything is okay. Everything is perfect. Everything is fine. If they say things like that, it means that they don't trust you. Possibly they don't trust themselves. You're doing something wrong. There's something wrong within the team. And it's your job as a leader to change that. So when you're authentic and you're fair, you will always hear new ideas, ideas for improvements, not complaining. I'm not talking about complaining. I'm talking about ideas for improvement. Being fair while we're on that point. What I mean by that is devote a similar amount of time to your team members, to your different team members. If you don't, some of them will not feel as important as the other ones and that will weaken your team, right? So you don't want to ever use just one person as an example, right? Always give them as an example. Remember, everybody is unique. You know their talents, you know their skills, you know their weak sides, you know what they're working on. Use them as examples, various examples for the team. Engage them equally. Everything has to be more or less equal because otherwise you don't have a uh, strong team. It's a poor team. Uh, number six. So one of my best, my best mentor, my best mentor, who is also my manager, he would, um, so the rule is form relationships individually and foster teamwork. So this mentor of mine, whenever I was talking to him, he was, uh, he made me feel like I am super unique and super special. Like I would leave these meetings all energized uh, because he had a way of talking to me and he had a different way of talking to other people. Anyway, I felt so special after these meetings. But whenever we were in a team meeting, he never tried to make anybody stand out, like really, really stand out for a longer amount of time. Of course, we celebrated successes, absolutely. We shared knowledge, we did all of that, right? But he was the one that taught me the importance of diverse teams. He was the one that taught me that I can be special in a relationship, in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with him, but I cannot be special within a team. I am a team member. So you wanna foster that uh, teamwork. And one of uh, ways to do that, which is often overlooked, is to celebrate together. So any success, small or big, should be in some way celebrated. Going out together, I mean, I'm not saying you have to go out, maybe it's just a celebration within the, at, at the office, right? But going out together causes teamwork, um, causes the team to get to know each other uh, better, also understand who they are, see them from uh, different uh, angles, etc. So celebration has many, many, many benefits. And I think you should celebrate every couple months, basically. Um, and the last rule is, it's not about you. It is never about you if you're a leader. So what does a leader do? There's like seven or 11, I don't remember, types of leadership, right? You can read about them. Uh, but it's never about you. A leader is supposed to lead, meaning he has done it probably. Sometimes he will be in a situation where his team has to do something that he hasn't done, right? But most of the time, he's going to be leading the team through something that he has done. And that doesn't mean he is supposed to be the problem solver. And that doesn't mean that the team's success is his success. 
Now that's when things get tough. And I think this is one of the most difficult roles of a leader. This is one of the most difficult tasks of a leader to always make everything about the team, the team's success. So if you're going to the management, for example, or your upline uh, reporting on the progress and successes, you always, always talk about your team members and never talk about you and never talk about any of this being your achievement. Now that's why leaders get lonely. You don't want to be the know-it-all either. So if you have a team, you're going to have your specialists. Maybe they are specialists in IT, for example, they have their, their special specializations, or maybe they're going to be a specialist personality wise, right? So ask the right person the right question. Even if you know the answer, even if you know the answer, ask them, engage them and make them feel like it's about them. Make them feel important. This all, I mean, all of these rules really, do you see how they fit brilliantly together and really form a nice, strong team? The vision, the diversity, the leading, that it not being about you, everything forms a nice environment of growth, that, uh, for growth of people and for growth of teams. So I think these are really the most important parts. And the last thing that I want to share is uh, the way I lead, I am, um, I tend to be an umbrella for my team. I call myself the umbrella. So to protect them from their shit that falls from the top. So basically, if you had a uh, difficult talk with top management and your team is not for performing, you don't go to them and you don't repeat the talk to them and you don't convey the problems and the stress on them. The stress accumulates on you, on the umbrella. That's why I say this last point, the seventh point, is the most difficult for leaders. What you want to do is you want to share the problem with the team and make them focus on the solution, not on the stress. Because people under stress, they don't work well. If you show them, yeah, work together. If you show them that there is something wrong, they will focus on the emotions and, and the feelings around it and they will start maybe blaming uh, themselves or each other and that is really not the best solution. Right, that's it for today. I think I managed to make it shorter. I am not sure. Let me know what you thought. I know it's a little bit of a different topic. Nonetheless, still very important. Share the video if you found it uh, valuable. And um, this week's interview is tomorrow at seven. It's not going to be on Wednesday. It's going to be on Tuesday. <coughs> I will let you know who that is in the morning. Bye guys. Enjoy your evening. Navid, thanks for watching. Bye.